Rosalind Franklin's work at King's College London is now well known. Slide. Uh, just to confirm, can you hear that okay? Yes, fine, absolutely fine. And her beautiful diffraction patterns from DNA are in every textbook on the subject. These days credited to her and usually recognizing her enormous contribution to the DNA structure. But King's was not a good fit for Rosalind as so many accounts have pointed out. In 1953, she left King's and joined J.D. Bernal's physics department at Birkbeck College. The two institutions could not be more different. King's was aristocratic and high profile. Birkbeck was working class. It started life in 1823 as the London Mechanics Institute. Bernal was a well-known communist. Rosalind was from a conservative upper-class family, but they respected each other as scientists. And Rosalind stayed away from Bernal's politics and his notorious reputation as a Don Juan. Slide. Bernal had been interested in tobacco mosaic virus since the 1930s. In 1936, he published the first oriented fiber diffraction pattern from TMV with Borden and Perry, the virologist, and his postdoc, Isidore Van Kuchen. Slide. Bernal and Van Kuchen published a much more detailed account of their work with TMV in 1941. By that time, Fan had returned to America and Bernal was busy with the war. And actually in the 1970s, Dorothy Hodgkin, who had been Bernal's student, told me that she put the paper together and submitted and handled it. This is not acknowledged in the paper. In fact, nobody is acknowledged in the paper for anything. That's how they wrote papers in those days. Slide. Bernal by this time had set TMV aside for years. But when Rosalind started working at Birkbeck, she took up the project. She built up a group that today reads like a who's who of fiber diffraction. Ken Holmes and John Finch were graduate students and Aaron Klug was on a postdoctoral fellowship. He had already, I'm sorry, he had actually come from Cambridge and before that South Africa to Birkbeck shortly before Rosalind arrived. In 1954, Rosalind visited America and met a number of people who had worked on TMV. Perhaps even more importantly, as a result of that visit in 1955, Don Casper, who had recently completed his PhD at Yale on TMV, visited England and spent a number of months working with Rosalind at Birkbeck. So these were the giants of TMV structure in the 1950s. Rosalind, Aaron, Ken, who later became my postdoctoral advisor, John and Don Casper, their American collaborator and friend. Rosalind was an outstanding experimentalist. And like many experimentalists of that time, sometimes took a rather cavalier attitude to the dangers of a scientific laboratory. Slide. This was entirely in character. She was an intrepid mountain climber. Some writers have commented about the way Rosalind worked around X-ray generators. The way Ken Holmes told it to me though, was much further down that road than anything I have read. Remember, the X-ray sets of those days did not generate an enormous X-ray flux. The TMV diffraction patterns that we produce now in 10 seconds or less at a synchrotron source took 100 hours on my old Elliott GX6 rotating anode generator. And my dim memory is that the sealed tubes before that required another factor of five or 10. But X-rays are X-rays 
and exposure is never a good idea, even at the sealed tube flux. Now, before we could get a good diffraction pattern, we had to find the beam and focus it using mirrors and quartz crystals. Some of you may remember waving fluorescent screens around looking for the X-ray beam. Rosalind had a simpler approach. She simply looked down the line of the beam. Apparently, if everything is correctly aligned, you can see the bright spot where the electrons hit the anode. I have never tried it. Some people have speculated that the ovarian cancer that ended Rosalind's life might have been a consequence of her laboratory practices. From what I have read, that is unlikely, at least as far as looking down the beam is concerned. But it is possible. So what were Rosalind's contributions to the TMV project? Slide. First, data. Just as she had with DNA, Rosalind obtained the best diffraction patterns yet seen from TMV. She particularly worked with her student, Ken Holmes, who was also an outstanding experimentalist and obtained diffraction patterns, as you can see, even better than Bernal's slide. In fact, the quality of the oriented souls they made was never exceeded. X-ray generators improved, and eventually, of course, we had synchrotrons, but the samples themselves were brought to perfection by Rosalind and Ken. The pattern obtained by Ki Chinamba in my lab in 1982 from a sample made years earlier by Ken Holmes was used by us to determine the TMV structure. Yes, it's a little bit better than the 1950s patterns, but the greatest progress from Bernal's 1936 data was already evident in Rosalind's 1950s data. Slide. It's worth mentioning Rosalind's work with the cylindrically average Patterson function of TMV. A fiber diffraction cannot pattern, a pattern cannot be used to calculate a true Patterson map. But McGillivray and Bruins had shown in 1945 that's in volume one of Acta Crystallographica, that cylindrically average Pattersons can be calculated. Pattersons had always interested Rosalind. Other approaches in her lab were eventually more useful, but her Pattersons should not be forgotten. In her 1955 Nature paper, she showed Patterson peaks, you can see them marked here, at 11 angstrom intervals, which she correctly interpreted as corresponding to a double helix. I'm sorry, to a double layer of alpha helices. Slide. And our structure in 1975 and at higher resolution in 1989 showed that she was perfectly correct. Slide. A major contribution that Rosalind made to TMV structural studies was to realize that the method of isomorphous replacement, suitably modified, could be used to determine phases in fiber diffraction. Green, Ingram, and Perutz had applied isomorphous replacement to protein crystallography in 1954. And of course, this eventually led to the first protein structures and dominated protein crystallography for decades. Rosalind used a mercury derivative to determine the phases of the TMV equator. And at the same time, Don Casper was using a lead derivative of a helical form of the TMV coat protein. The coat protein structure is isomorphous with the virus. So it is essentially the virus without the RNA. These single derivatives were enough for Rosalind and Don to calculate radial density distributions, that is electron density, as a function of distance from the axis of the viral helix. And as you can see, the radial density distributions are almost identical, except for a large peak, see it on the left there, 40 angstroms from the axis. So it was clear that the RNA followed the coat protein helix at a radius of 40 angstroms. 
1956, they published companion papers in Nature describing these very exciting results. Don Casper is now 94 years old and is one of the most brilliant scientists of his generation. He continued firing off ideas to his former students and postdocs into his 90s, but he has always suffered from an immovable writer's block. In fact, he has never particularly enjoyed writing papers and most of his papers were mostly written by his co-authors. Problem, this paper had no co-author. According to Rosalind's biographer, Brenda Maddox, Rosalind wrote every word of Don's paper so that her own could be published with it. Slide. Another of Rosalind's achievements with TMV, this one with Ken Holmes, was to determine the definitive symmetry of the virus. Many and varied estimates had been made over the years by looking at meridional layer lines, Watson suggested that there were 31 subunits in three turns of the helix. Then in 1955, using the same approach from better data, Rosalind suggested that this number should be 37, but she left open the possibility of a larger number. Since meridional layer lines are difficult to measure and not unambiguous, Ken and Roslyn instead used equatorial data from the virus and the mercury derivative to determine that the symmetry was actually 49 subunits in three turns of the viral helix in 1958. Many years later, Lee Murkowski and I showed that there are actually 49.02 subunits per turn of the helix. So let's agree with Ken and Roslyn that it was 49. Slide. Rosalind was invited to build models of TMV and also, also incidentally, the spherical virus, poliovirus, which she'd recently become interested in, to display at the Brussels World's Fair in 1958, showing everything her group had learned about the virus up to that time. They had the symmetry of TMV, they had the dimensions of the protein subunits and the location of the RNA. Slide. Ken once told me that the subunit dimensions were not quite right when they first built that model and someone, I think it was John Finch, had to file every subunit down to fit into the model with the right symmetry. The World's Fair was a great success for Britain, emphasizing advances in science and technology, and the TMV model was one of the most memorable exhibits but Rosalind never saw the model exhibited. She died the day before the Brussels World's Fair opened. Aaron Klug took the model with him when he moved to Cambridge, and it remains there to this day. After Rosalind's death, Aaron, Ken, and John moved to LMB Cambridge. We called it MRC Cambridge in those days. In the mid 1960s, Ken, moved to the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg as head of the new biophysics department, and he took the fiber diffraction project with him. Aaron stayed in Cambridge with John Finch, working on the crystallography of the isolated coat protein and the electron microscopy of the virus. Of course, Aaron received the Nobel Prize in 1982, primarily for his contributions to electron microscopy. So Rosalind and her group had made fiber diffraction samples of unprecedented quality. They had obtained the best fiber diffraction patterns up to that time. She had used Patterson syntheses to determine the packing of the alpha helices in the protein subunit. She and Don Casper had determined the radial density distribution. And with Ken Holmes, she had determined the correct symmetry for the viral helix. But above all, she established the project as a viable path to an atomic structure. None of her predecessors seem to have talked much about this possibility, although I'm sure they thought about it. Slide. 
I arrived in Heidelberg in 1972. Rosalind's presence permeated the lab, especially in the TMV project that I took over. I remember that we had a transparent ruler in the lab marked R.E. Franklin. I coveted that ruler, but of course, Ken would never let go of it. But we did use that ruler to measure the distances in the model of TMV that we came up with in 1976, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Slide. At this point, the obstacle to further work on the TMV structure was the problem of overlapping intensities in fiber diffraction. In a fiber diffraction sample, the filaments that make up the fiber, that would be the individual virus particles in the case of TMV, are randomly oriented about the fiber axis. So diffraction data in reciprocal space are cylindrically averaged. That problem had not been solved at Birkbeck, but Rosalind was well aware of it. Slide. The nature of the overlapping intensities was analyzed by Rosalind and Aaron. They published, they had published that in 1955. The diffracted intensity depends on the Fourier Bessel structure factor G, which is analogous to the crystal structure factor F. So the fiber diffraction phase problem requires the determination of rather than two unknowns, two times N unknowns. And for TMV, N varies from one at low resolution, but only to about 12 angstroms, to as high as eight on some of the layer lines at three angstroms resolution. So that's a lot of unknowns to determine. Slide. But that does mean that electron density can be calculated if you know all of these complex G terms, often called Bessel terms because each G depends on one order of Bessel functions, J. Rosalind, Ken, and Aaron had ideas about separating two Bessel functions by isomorphous replacement or some other technique but they were not able to make them work. In the years following Rosalind's death, Ken and Aaron often said in talks and sometimes in publications that the resolution limit for the virus structure would be about six angstroms. That would require two Bessel terms to be separated. Actually, the resolution if they had done that would have been lower than six angstroms. The equatorial resolution using two vessel terms would be about six angstroms, but the other layer lines would require more than two terms to be separated. Even so, Rosalind was well aware of the problem of separating vessel terms, but Ken told me that she nevertheless believed that the data were good enough for a three angstrom structure. She didn't have a specific plan at that time. She just had a gut feeling that came from her superb experimental ability and her instinct for data. Slide. So separating the Bessel terms was the most important of the problems I worked on in Heidelberg. Steve Warren and I separated three orders and with Ken we published a four angstrom structure. That was enough resolution to build a model of about 70% of the protein and all of the RNA. Slide. Then later, when I was in Don Casper's lab at Brandeis and eventually in my own lab at Vanderbilt, Keiichi Namba and I separated eight vessel orders. When Keiichi, Reka Patanayak and I published the structure in 1989, 31 years after Rosalind's death, we had a nominal resolution of 2.9 angstroms. Let's just say three angstroms and agree that Rosalind was spot on. Slide. I think it was when I first figured out how to separate vessel orders, but it may have been something else that Ken said, so that's what Rosalind was telling us just before she died. Rosalind left Ken and Aaron with a lot of ideas for TMV. They carried out some of them and I like to think that I and my lab finished working her ideas out. We owe her 
an incalculable death, both for her achievements and for her vision. So do you think if you could separate even more orders, you'd have been able to push the resolution up even further? I don't think so. Um, the, the layer lines are beginning to smear into each other at around three angstrom resolution. I wondered, and Ken wondered, if perhaps they could be pushed to two and a half angstrom resolution. But Keiichi did actually try to go a little bit further with a sort of molecular replacement approach without any success. So I think for those data, three angstroms or 2.9 was about the limit. 